Good day to all. This is the second part of our discussions about valuing stocks or stock valuation. And let's begin with stock valuation of preferred stock, also known as preference share. As defined, preferred stock or preference share is an equity security or instrument or financial instrument that is expected to pay a fixed annual dividend indefinitely. As being said in our previous discussions, which is part one basically of valuing stocks or stock valuation, we've mentioned that normally to compute the amount of dividends to be allocated to preferred stocks or preference shares, especially the shareholders, such should be computed as percentage multiplied by the outstanding share capital. And as said, outstanding share capital basically is the difference between the total amount issued of the shares times the par value equals the share capital of that the issued, less any treasury shares which are already bought back by the company or corporation. And then this provides the shareholder the right to receive, but not, of course, really a guarantee to receive a fixed annual dividend, but that is indefinite, of course. Now, what is the formula for us to know how much really is the value of the preferred stock? So the formula is the amount of the dividend of the next period divided by the discount rate. So as you can see on our legend or our acronyms or symbols, so we can see here that D sub P is the next experience dividend payment, that's the numerator, and the denominator is R sub P, which is the discount rate, and then that will result to the difference of P S sub zero, which is the preferred stock or the preference shares market price or value or current rate or price. As an example, we have here, investors require an 11% return on a preferred stock that pays a $2.30 annual dividend. So the question now is, what is the price? So using the formula and substituting the values, $2.3 divided by 0.11 is $20.9 or $90 per share. So basically, this is the value of the preferred stock. All right, quite easy or easier. If you can recall, we mentioned about present value of cash flows in perpetuity or continuous amount. So this is how we computed the present value. Next, what about for the common stock? So supposing or suppose that an investor buys a stock today for price, which is P sub zero, and then receives a dividend equal to D sub one. This is the dividend of the next period or at the end of the next year, and then immediately sells the stock for price P sub one. So for sure, there is really a value or increased value of that because the basic concept in selling is that we should buy low, and if we sell it, it should be higher than the price before or the amount or the cost before. So the return on investment is equal to the rate or the R, which is equal to the dividend of the next period plus the difference. Actually, if you can see, the formula seems to have like the P sub one added immediately to the dividend. But if we are going to scrutinize the formula so we can like enclose this in parentheses, as well as the other one, end close or open and end or open close. And then P sub one, which is the price or the selling price of the share, less its cost before a spot. So this is now the capital gain as said, because the price of selling it is higher than buying it, divided by P sub zero, the cost before. So basically, the numerator will be all returns of the investment in the form of dividend and the capital gain. So that, that's the return on investment. And then how much is the value of a share of a common stock? So P sub zero, meaning the price of that, or the value of the stock, which is common, is equal to the sum of B sub one, so the dividend plus P sub one, so basically the total amounts received 
or cash flows received in the form of dividend, and then of course the selling price divided by the quantity one plus r to the power of one. Of course, that's of course one year. Then how is P1 determined then? So present value of expected stock price P sub two plus the dividends. And P sub two is the PV of P sub three plus dividends and etc. So repeating this logic over and over, you will find that today's price equals the present value of the entire dividend stream that the stock will pay in the future. So like this one. In other words, it will be the summation of all dividends to be received. So that's why we have this particular formula. And then what we can do here is that we can just add them. And then it's like, for example, going back for P sub zero for the price today. So we estimate as to the price the next year. So that's P zero. And then for the next period, like P one, so we go forward with one year, the PV of expected stock price at P sub two, then we add also the dividends. So this goes on and on. P2 is now the PV of P3 plus the dividends that there would be in the next year. So this would continue, of course, in terms of the logic of this one. So again, the price today is the present value of the entire dividend stream that the stock will pay in the future. Next, zero growth valuation model. So this is the simplest approach that assumes a constant non-growing dividend stream. I said zero growth, so same or constant amount of dividends all throughout the years. With constant value, so we can think of the formula for the preferred stock or preference share. This is the same. And that is the cash flow, like present value in perpetuity. So that's P sub zero equals the dividend in the next year divided by the rate. What about for constant growth valuation model? In this case, there is a constant rate growth and then normally that is less than the required return. So required return is like the R overall, which is the total amount of return coming from the dividends of the next year and the capital gains out of selling the said shares. So G is lesser than R. If dividends grow, at a constant rate forever, you can value stock as a growing perpetuity as well. So we denote next year's dividend as P sub one. Good thing that we have like the same symbols or variables for our formulas. So here we can denote the formula as P sub zero equals V sub one over R minus G. All right. And this particular formula is called Gordon growth model. Okay, so take note of this formula that is very important. Then what is the example? So let's say Dynasty Corporation pays a $3 dividend in one year. And then the growth is constant forever and required rate of return is 10% R. So what is the stock worth? Now, if this is as simple as this one, so of course we have two values, so that's $3 divided by 0.1 equals $30 value of the stock or stocks. Then what if there is a growth rate of 3%? So it would be modified, the it is the formula, the denominator would become R minus G. So that would be P sub zero equals D sub one over R, which is 0.10 minus 0 0.03. If we substitute a force and simplify that's $3 over 0.07, it costs $42.86. If you have your calculators, you can verify there. Then what about if we expand our analysis to variable growth valuation model? So in variable growth model, there, of course, are different growth rates all throughout the periods or different periods of time. 
So if we are going to have our analysis in formula form, so P sub zero, or again, P sub zero is the value of the stock or stocks, which is the dividend at time zero, then the growth rate divided by one plus R, which is the, of course, present value of one plus the required rate of return to the power of one. And then for the next year, as we go along the way, if you can notice for the first part here, let me point that. So this is basically the formula, if you can recall, to estimate it at the time for the first year. All right. And of course, so we can say this is the time zero. Okay. So at the end of the first year and then going forward with the second year, so this is how we do it. We can recall like the P0, or the price or value at zero is estimating plus one year. So the dividend in the coming year plus the price, of course, in the coming year also less the price of it at, let's say, when it was bought or the share was bought and then divided by our appropriate denominator. So depending on what we are getting or deriving at, whether that's the required rate of return, in which we divide it by P0 or the cost, or for example, that's D1 plus P1 over the cost. If, for example, we want to know really how much is its value. And also to exemplify, we have to take note that if we say return, that's ROI return on, not of, because if it is an of, meaning that's a liquidation of capital that should be on, on top of the capital or investment. So remember the formula is what is the profit or gain or dividend divided by the cost, right? And if we would like to know the P sub zero, which is the price, so the denominator should be some form of a rate because that should be the amount, total amount of whatever we obtain the cash flows divided by the corresponding rates. All right, so as we go along the way, we have to extend the formula. So it should be the third power for the third year, dot, dot, dot. So these are the dividends, present values during initial growth phase, plus the present value of stock price at the end of the initial growth phase. So meaning to say this is the so-called terminal value because it is at the end. All right. So valuing a stock using the variable growth model, the stock's value consists of the present value of dividends during the three-year rapid growth phase. And we are using the formula, which is the dividend of the next year divided by one plus R, the required rate of return to the power of whatever period that is. So if that's the first year, second year, and so on and the present value of the constant growth perpetuity, which begins in four years. So perpetuity, that is continuous or series of cash flows, but done in a constant manner. So if you can see in the graph, we are done with the rapid growth phase and we have the three present values. So we have like 2.10, 2.22, and 2.34 with these three dividends to be received respectively. Then for the last item, which is in perpetuity, of course, we have known that the amount of the, let's say, price of the share, which is the number or the number four or the fourth dividend, so the dividend in the fourth year, which is $3.63, divided by R minus the constant growth rate. So this is like the Gordon model of computing the dividends and the price respectively. So $3.63 divided by the difference, 0.14 minus 0.05, that's 0.09. Please verify with your calculators. So we will get 40.33. Now this is the price of the, or the value of the stock at the end of the third year. So if we are going to 
compute the present value of that. So that would be similar with the present value of dividends during initial growth phase. All right. So some would be asking, why is it free? Because at the end of the third year, actually, that's the time that we determined its value to be added to the present value. If this happened at the fourth year, so we should step back one year prior to be able to compute the present value of that. Otherwise, it would be at the end of the fourth year, so same time, it's no more present value of that. Normally, this is the situation. So end of the rapid growth phase, that's the time that we do the analysis for the end of initial growth phase. All right, so hopefully you got that. And then that's why we should get the overall value of this particular stock with the variable growth at $33.88, the sum of the four present values. Okay, next, for stock valuation, another important point would be how to estimate the growth rate or G. So that is the retention rate, which is the rate by which the company would be keeping or retaining or maintaining or setting aside or appropriating a portion of the retained earnings now known as accumulated profits and losses. In a corporate form of business organization, dividends are to be provided to the shareholders as their shares of the profits of the corporation. However, as said in our laws, that the said provision of dividends is not compulsory or required, legally speaking, of course. So it is normally given in regular manner for some corporations as sort of giving happiness or, of course, showing to the public that the company is really serious about providing shares of profits to the people or investors. We call that the dividend signaling model. So that is discussed in other parts or topics in financial management. What is that dividend signaling? But the point is that by giving dividends, so the public would be thinking that, oh, this company is profitable because it keeps on providing more and more dividends, especially for increasing ones. All right, so moving on, what if not all, which is the normal situation anyway, that not all will be returned as dividends. So some, if not all of the companies would be maintaining large portions of their retained earnings or accumulated profits for certain purposes. So whatever that rate is, that's the retention rate times the return on equity, which is the net income available to ordinary shareholders normally or the equity shareholders. And then, but again, normally it will be the common stockholders or ordinary shareholders divided by the outstanding share capital of the common stockholders or ordinary shareholders. Mind you that depending on the book, some books would be using various formulas for ROE. So as for me, I am basing it from this particular source by Smart and Meginson. But some authors would have different values and formulas, so we respect that. And based also on historical data, trend or patterns of the growth rate. What if there are no dividends? So this is the question, right? So how can we compute the values of the stocks wherein normally we are basing it numerator dividends as part? Okay, added with the estimated price at the next year divided by the rate, correct? So that's the question. So clarify also, I said that formula, if ever, for example, the dividends and the price of the stocks in the next year will be combined divided by one plus R to the power of the appropriate period or T or N, depending on the case, depending also on the book, what variable that is used as exponent, if ever, of course, we're talking about the same growth or same pattern. But of course, we have already recalled a while ago that if the growth is variable, so normally we separate the dividends and the price. So let me go back to that part here. So if you can notice, dividends and the stocks are divided. But for the other parts, we also can realize that they are actually mixed, just like this formula at the bottom, but then it's because the assumption here is that the stocks are immediately sold. 
But with our analysis further on, we can recall with our problems here, our basis would be dividends wherein we do not actually sell our stocks. They are kept as long-term investments. A while ago, the formula was for trading purposes wherein we buy shares and we sell the shares at higher prices. But for this, for the subsequent discussion or discussions respectively, we're talking about long-term investment. They are kept and then they are earning and earning with more dividends. All right? So it's like we have two situations here. Going back, let me go back once again. So here, this part here is trading for trading purposes. And then as we go along the way, like zero growth, constant growth, and variable growth. So these are long-term investments then. And going back to the question, what if there are no dividends? So this would lead us to another approach. Also, we have to take note that normally what is discussed here from constant growth, variable growth, actually belong to common stocks or ordinary shares with IAS. So we just have to take note of that as well. And that's why with the formula here, which is the free cash flow or the FCF approach, this is also discussed in the statement of cash flows analysis. Well, we have to go back with certain terms like free cash flow and the weighted average cost of capital, FCF and WAC respectively. For free cash flow, this is the net amount of cash flow remaining or available after the firm has met all operating needs and paid for investments, both long-term and short-term, hence from the term rate, so available for whatever purpose. And this is also the cash that a firm could distribute to investors after meeting all its other obligations. So that would be like total cash, less cash for operations needed for such or operations, then minus the investments needs and minus the obligations or the liabilities or debts needs. On the other hand, if you say WAC, that would be the after tax weighted average required return on all types of securities issued by a firm. So normally we look into the components of our liabilities and shareholders equity section. So how much is our debt or liability or financial obligation then we get the principal amount or amounts as well as the outstanding share capital amounts of ordinary shares and the preference shares. So by then, or the reverse, preference first and ordinary, then we can develop a fraction of that and we multiply with the corresponding required rates of return. So that's how we should have obtained WAC. Now, this can be quite unique for free cash flow though. So estimate the free cash flow that the firm will generate over time. Discount the free cash flow at the firm's weighted average cost of capital to derive the total value of the firm. So the assumption here is that the WAC is even. Third step, to get the value of the common stocks or the ordinary shares that is denoted by the variable V sub S, the total or the overall firm or firm's value, V sub F, is to be deducted with the value of the debt minus the value of the preferred stock. And that will be the remainder or the difference. Then if we divide V sub S, the value of the ordinary shares or common stocks, by the number of shares outstanding, we get the price of the stock per share. That's P sub zero. So as an example, at the end of the 2006 fiscal year, Starbucks had debt with a market value of about $250 million, no preferred stock, good thing in this example, 765 million shares of common stock or ordinary share, and then free cash flow of $217 million, so it is given. Then revenues and operating profits grew at 21% between 2004 and 2006. Assume 20% free cash flow growth from 2006 to 2010 and 10% annual growth thereafter. So this is like the steady 20% and then the 10% is like in perpetuity. If you can recall with variable growth model. So moving on, WAC is 12%. And we can see here on the table, 
So growth rate, of course, at the beginning is zero, but then we have the steady, but of course it's fast, it's steady, but it's fast rapid growth. And then this is steady and stable. All right, so free cash flow calculation is $270 million multiplied by the corresponding one plus R, required rate of return of 20% to the power of the respective period. So beginning in 2007, that's one, two, three, and four. Then we should not confuse ourselves with this particular formula wherein we actually use the future value factors. It's because our free cash flow is growing. So based on the assumption that it is growing from 2006 to 2010 and knowing the loss of compounding, so whatever is the value at the end of the first year, that would also increase as we go along the way. So that's why for second year, it is squared, and then it's tripled and quadrupled, respectively. Well, for the last cash flow, so we use the value at the end of the fourth year, and we multiply that with another rate, which is now the stable. So we get now our free cash flows finally. Then we use that to compute the firm's value. So this time we can now compute it using the formula with what we have known, and that is the value, overall value, divided by the one plus the rate for the respective year. So present value now, not future value. And then plus the terminal or the value at the end of the initial phase. So that would be whatever is the free cash flow divided by the rate minus the growth rate. So I was about to say the Gordon model, which is actually the same or which is true, is the Gordon model. So that is our D sub one or the dividend divided by R minus G. That is if we have the constant growth rate as assumption, which is the assumption here, of course. And that is true, multiplied by the corresponding rate. If you can recall, remember, if this is like the fifth year, we have to know the value of it one year back or at the end of the fast, but still like steady or let's just say constant or same rate, but it's a fast growing portion or fast growing years. And if we are going to get the total, so that will be the overall firm's value. All right, so for a while. Moving on, the value of the ordinary shares or common stocks would be the overall firm or firm's value then minus the value for the debt, which is $250 million and no preference shareholders equity or value. So with that, that would be the amount of the value of the ordinary shares or common stocks. If we divide this by the ordinary shares outstanding, so we get the price per share of the ordinary shares or the common shares. Okay, so that is $26.94. What are the other approaches to common stock valuation? So we can do the book value per share analysis, which is discussed in partnership and corporation accounting, especially in corporation accounting, of course. Or we can also do the liquidation value analysis. So this is the amount that remains if the firm's assets are sold and all liabilities paid. So we assume that the business now is already at the end or verge of its ending of operations so termination of operations, but it's not going to be automatic, of course. If you talk about liquidation process, it will take time because our non-cash assets are still to be sold to add to the cash to pay the liabilities and whatever will remain will be given to the shareholders. Preference will be preferred and then remaining to ordinary shareholders or the preferred stockholders or preference shareholders respectively. So I kept on mentioning the two terms, guys, because sometimes we forget about them. And now we are at the end of our discussions. Also, we can do the P over A multiples or price over earnings ratio 
in which normally the price, which is true, our price overall, because this reflects about the overall experience of the stocks divided by the earnings. So amount investors are willing to pay for each dollar of earnings. And then as what I've said, P numerator is higher than E and the ratios differ between industries. All right, so to summarize, let us know that preferred stock has both debt and equity-like features, although preferred stock really is an equity. If ever, for example, we would like to have such as debt, you know that already in PFRS 9, preference stocks or shares or preferred stocks which are redeemable, meaning to be bought back by the corporation at a certain period of time or at the end of a certain contract period, then that is liability or that is under liabilities because it has a certain feature very similar and essentially the same as debt or obligation in which it has a maturity date. So again, redeemable preference stocks or preference shares are liabilities. In the absence of any evidence to the contrary, all preferred stocks are equity or part of equity. Next, common stock represents residual claims on the firm's cash flows. Whatever will remain from the equity by deducting preferred stocks will be for common stocks. Then, as what we've said, investment bankers would be playing an important role in helping firms to issue new securities, especially in initial public offering. And finally, the same principles apply to the valuation of both preferred and common stock in getting our P sub zero with the exception of additional rates or additional concepts like the constant growth and variable growth model, All right? So thank you very much for listening, guys. Hopefully you learned something in this session. God bless us all.